We shouldn't be teaching everyone about every law of the country that they're going to, but we should be helping facilitate where they look, how they look, the importance of understanding and how they use that information while they're away. So the world of TNL has changed dramatically and facilitating students to get that information and to be independent in the same way that they would be independent if they were traveling independently, that's what I think we've lost the will to live. Hi, I'm Dirk Walder, founder of the Koala News. I'm coming to you from Wanjuk Nukawa country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society, coming to you from my holiday today on the wonderful sunny sunshine coast. Oh, it's a bit rainy today. I'm on Cubby Cubby country today. And Dirk might be on holidays, but I must say I've been thinking a lot about work because one of the biggest changes that we could possibly have expected just came out of the blue and smacked us in the side of the head a couple of weeks back. Let's talk about the increase in the visa fee. Yeah, incredible, isn't it? I mean, we literally had Phil Honeywood in not too long ago and yeah, straight after I think Phil was on, we were into the visa fee. So incredible. Yeah. So look, I mean, the headline, as most people will probably know, because it, it, it did happen on the 1st of July, roughly about 10 or so days ago, increased from $710 to $1,600, about 125% hike in uh, in a visa fee. Pretty extraordinary. Extraordinary from a few different angles, if I can say that. Firstly, I guess, just covering off the announcement itself, nobody seemed to really see it coming. And from you know the people that I talked to, there were probably a couple of people that had a phone call on the Sunday night previous to be have given a heads up. But I've got to tell you that Monday morning when the, when the, when the, the release was uploaded, nobody really saw it coming. <laughs> you know, it's funny. They should they should have included student visa fees in the CPI because government wouldn't have freaking dared to touch, you know, visa fees and increase them by 125% if it was included in the cost of inflation or rising inflation. Absolutely. So, yeah, so look, over the last two weeks, there's obviously been quite a bit of work done in terms of analysing exactly what the impact will be, if I can put it that way. I think the, you know, I think what we're fighting with a lot of these government decisions at the moment is they're kind of what seem to be simplistic solutions to obvious problems, if I can say that. And when I say obvious problems, I mean obvious government problems, obviously wanting to reduce demand for incoming international students. But what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is, I guess, on a few different things. So firstly, last Friday, the IAA wrote to Minister Clare and Minister O'Neill seeking a, I guess, a the want of a better word, either a moratorium or a reduction in that visa fee for learning abroad students. And you know, we've got Trevor Goddard on the podcast a little bit later, and I'm sure that we'll dig into it a little bit more. But essentially, you know, 710 to 1600 dollars it'll act as a massive disincentive for study abroad students or, or learning abroad students coming into Australia to do that. That'll create a couple of things. So one is if students drop off, that's a bad thing for Australia. And the reason it's a bad thing for Australia is that most exchange agreements operate on what we term reciprocity. So essentially, as simply as that works, you send us two students, we'll send you two students back and we're even. Now, if the numbers coming in are only one or none for a number of semesters, that reduces the ability for Australian institutions to be able to send their students out. There's a real negative effect that that may occur through that. The other is students that might be coming in, again, if you're coming for six months and you're needing to pay $1,600 for a visa, now, as I understand it, there may be an opportunity to access other visas to be able to be here and do shorter term study. So the, I guess the rationale and what we've been hearing from the government is cleaning up the visa system, adding integrity. This may actually drive behaviour that is counterintuitive to that. So again, what, what we're seeing is unintended consequences, I think, is the line that are coming from, again, simplistic solutions to simplistic government problems. We see that beyond this, beyond just learning abroad as well. So I know that, you know, for instance, in the English space, you know, if you're coming for a five-week English program or a 10-week English program, and you're now having to pay $1,600 for a visa for that, what's going to be the disincentive to actually enrolling in that? And maybe the government says, you know, bang on, that's what we're trying to do. But it does seem to disproportionately affect some of the international student market rather than just looking at what most people would assume is a three-year bachelor or four-year bachelor student or a two-year master student where that visa cost can be spread out over a longer period of time. Yeah, and as, as you've pointed out, 
both on this podcast and, and in the koala, you know, at the moment with visa processing being feels like a lucky tip, you know, if you're going to get your visa or not, even if you're in, in one of the category one, you know, institutions, even if you're going to a category one institution under the simplified student visa framework, the SSVF, yeah, the, the certainty for people to basically gamble 1600 bucks not knowing whether or not their visa is going to be approved is kind of just getting beyond the realms of, of what's fair for starters, yeah. but what people are going to be prepared to do. That's, that's just reality. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we looked at with Study Move Consultants, so Kerry Ramirez and, and the team there, we actually worked through some modeling and the modeling would suggest, so if you think about, you know, the income to government from lodgements, and again, the, the point that you make is really important how elastic is our sector based on a visa fee? And I think we're going to find that out fairly shortly. So as the visa fee rises, you know, elasticity would say that purchases drop off. What we've seen, I guess, over the, over through this process and through the modelling is that we would require a 55% reduction in lodgements for the government to acquire the same amount of money as it did prior to the announcement, if that makes sense. So certainly the government's wanting to take the heat or, or take the demand out of it. If visa lodgements drop 30%, the government's going to be making more money. If, it, if they drop 40%, they're still going to be making more money than what they would in, in, the, in the government coffers. The break-even point that we found was a 55% reduction. If visa lodgements drop off more than 55%, the government's actually going to be in a worse position than what it is now in terms of income for the visas. Now, remember that this increase in the visa fee is meant to offset other programs in, in the government and that are being implemented through the accord process. So it's really, really important to understand the link between this and what the behaviour of lodgements and what students may do offshore will, will determine how successful other programs might be across the government. What's interesting, though, is that what you're talking about there is simply a reduction, or, you know, is, is the government coffers. Are the government mm -hmm. coffers going to be lower or you know, are impacted by that. But of course, if we have 30% less students in the country, the $48 billion impact for the country is impacted. So yeah, absolutely. It, government might be line ball on their, on, their, on their accounts, but the nation as a whole, and once again, like, I hate to oversimplify and just say that this is just a number, but um, sometimes you feel governments will only pay attention to the economics of this. But, you know, let's say it's a 20% decline, 30% decline, pick your number then shave that off a $48 billion industry and you're not just affecting institutions or government coffers. You're affecting mum and dad businesses down the street, certain oh, companies and fill in the blank. Like it's literally Australia-wide that we're, we're going to be seeing, seeing the pinch from this. It's just for sure, it's for sure. It's short-sighted, Dirk. Why do we Absolutely. I oh, know, it's incredible. So one of the things a company called Voyage did was actually they're a student-facing organization. They actually did a bit of research into the sentiment that students feel, and a number of these are offshore as well. So what we're seeing is 49.8% anger, 28.1% sadness, and 15.8% in disgust. So obviously Australia now having by far the highest student visa fee globally by daylight between the between Australia and the next one. This is the feeling that's coming back from students. And some of the, I guess, the more qualitative data that's coming back is that students are now asking themselves the question, are they cash cows? Are they actually the cash cows? Because it just seems a bit ridiculous. You know, I'm, I'll be fascinated to talk to Trevor Goddard, our guest, a little bit later on the episode, because Trevor is such a great long-term thinker. And I'm really looking forward to him unpacking some of those unexpected consequences because, mm. yeah, I mean, governments just, I, I think, are really bad at doing that generally. But we're lucky to have a guest on that's a very good thinker. So looking forward to hearing from Trevor a little, bit, a little bit later in the episode. And, of course, this is, this is already flowing through. Of course, the, the announcement about the visa cost has just landed, but mm. uh, visas being granted uh, are already down. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, we've spoken about this on many podcasts before, and but yeah, probably since you know middle of December when the ministerial direction was handed down, we saw a significant tail off in in visas being granted. Again, the team at Study Move, headed by Kerry Ramirez, 
did a little bit of a of a look into this. So look, the headlines really roughly around one hundred and sixty thousand fewer student visas compared to the same period last year, or down forty four percent. So it's a significant number. The most significant changes have been in student visas granted for VET. So VET's down 73% and ELICOS is down 52%. So when you think about ELICOS being, for the want of a better word, the canary in the coal mine, we've heard that, but also a pathway provider into other sectors, we're going to see that personified over time, that snowball is going to grow and that negativity. The, one of the interesting bit, tidbits that came out of, out of Kerry's work was across all sectors, students from India, Nepal, Colombia and the Philippines have at least a decrease of 60% in student visas granted compared to the same period last year. And why is that important? It's important because all these countries are in our top 10 source countries for Australia. And so when we think about that, countries in our top 10 decreasing by more than 60% significant. Rob, significant. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, and one of the comments that when the visa fee was released, I think one of the press releases, there was a comment from one of the ministers saying where we're fixing a broken system. And as you and I have discussed on this podcast, you know, we, we sort of broke it down and went, okay, so you're looking at a kind of shonky provider percentage of, of a couple of percent. You know, let's, let's, let's be generous and say that it's a 5% shonky provider ratio but it's like chopping off the limb <laughs> in, in order to stem the gangrene in stem the gangrene in one finger i was thinking about this analogy exactly before it probably if it was a car before it had a flat tire now it's up on blocks and it's missing and it's missing its wheels yeah right oh my goodness gracious i've and, and in fact the listeners I've, I've actually reached out to minister jason clare i've invited him to come on the podcast because I you know, get a lot of feedback from, from people who are, who are listening saying, okay, it's great hearing you guys break down the news and we've got a lot of stats and figures, but wouldn't it be great to hear from the minister who's, who's responsible for some of these enormous decisions? So Jason Clare, Jason Clare's team, if you're listening to this, we would love to have you on the podcast. Happy to give you questions in advance, but we'd love to hear exactly some of the rationale for some of these decisions. Let's move on, Dirk. Let's move to happier happier places. AIEC, the program is now out, the Australian International Education Conference. That's always a fun time of year seeing what's made the list. Absolutely, it is. I had a bit of a look over it, and mate, there's a session in there that really stood out to me. I'm actually really looking forward to it. Sally Gattenby, who was on the podcast a little while ago and is obviously one of the organisers or a key person involved in the organisation of AIAC, she's running a session with Andrew Tees from, and it's called Barbecue Conversations. And I, re I really like the sound of that. And I think we spoke with Sally offline about, about this exact topic. International education, often outside of the sector, it, people just don't know about it. And this session's focused on getting people to know about international education. What are the lines you can tell somebody over a barbecue? You stand around the barbecue having a glass of wine or a beer, and somebody says to you, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm in international education. Oh, is that like exchange? This is the session to go to, to start picking up some of those key points on how to talk to people outside of the sector socially about what we do. And I think it's so important, Rob, I really do. Yeah, love it. And we will have someone from IDP on in a couple of weeks. time on the next news episode to, to dive into detail on the full program. I'm really looking forward to it. I must admit, I only had time to sort of have a glance through some of the things that are on there, but I'm just so excited. Come October, it's going to be a great great conference. And full disclosure, the Global Horizons is the official podcast of the AIEC conference. And you will find me and Dirk, I hope you too, on the exhibition floor podcasting live. So definitely we'll be there on the floor. Moving along though, there's been a, an important appointment by Austrade, a new head of international education. Who's that? It is, drumroll, Elodie Journet. So Elodie has, has come in. She's now the Assistant General Manager of Education and Skills, I believe is the full title, which includes heading up international education promotion. So look, mate, I, firstly, I guess, let's look back. Melissa Banks obviously was in that role some time ago. Helen Kronberger has done a fantastic job in holding the fort until Elodie's appointment. But mate, I've got to tell you, I'm not sure I'd want to be in her shoes at the moment. I mean, could you imagine having the responsibility of promoting this sector while, you know, other, other parts of the government are pulling the handbrake. Mate, she's got a tough job, that's for sure. I guess, uh, you know, just sort of having looked through her profile on LinkedIn, I, I don't know Elodie personally, but deep experience inside Austrade and, and working inside government. So that all sort of points to 
the skill set that's that's needed to make those sort of incremental changes and um, you know to shift policy, set good policy. So it'd be very interesting to see, as you say, like wow, that's that's a heck of a job to to be picking up. And, mm-hmm. and best of luck to Elodie. We're looking forward to to working Absolutely. with her and the team going forward. And finally, mate, I, there was a very catchy headline in the Koala this week. <laughs> this has been one of your best. I'm, I must admit. And if you'll humour me, can I do this? Thunder yes, of course. Words, Argo. <laughs> I've been waiting all week to do that. <laughs> Thunderbirds ago. What are we talking about? Every time I see kind of like a launch announcement or something like that, I, I think of that line and it takes me back to, you know, when I was 10 years old, you know, watching the, the TV before I was mum and dad were going to take me to my little soccer game or whatever and sitting there watching the Thunderbirds and they'd always count down and say that exact line. So I love throwing it in where I can and I think it's really, really good. So yeah, look, mate, Thunderbirds ago, 54321. Deacon commences classes in India this week and I think it's such a fantastic thing that an Australian university is the first uh, university to open its doors in India, not just announcing, not just building, not just opening the doors, but now they're actually teaching. So 40 students in their first cohort across two programs, that's Master of Cyber Security, professional, and a Master of Business Analytics. So best of luck to Deakin, best of luck to, to obviously the first cohort, and you know certainly the koala is sitting back watching from afar and, and, and hoping it all goes really, really well. You've got to give them credit because they have really hustled to get that live, haven't they? Because it feels like they sure have. It feels like less than twelve months. It must only be nine yeah. months yeah, since the that. announcement by yeah. India opening up the doors to allow um, foreign providers to be onshore delivering their programs. Yeah. Deacon, of course, first first in the door, and Wollongong as well. Shortly thereafter, so to actually get programs up and running inside twelve months is, is a heck of an yeah. achievement. And of course, John Maloney is DVC International over there, so I'm sure had a had a yeah, hand in that. PVC, yeah, PVC, PVC, yeah. and you know a very, very very strong team at Deakin. So, well done to yeah, everybody over there. Deakin's had a massive presence in in South Asia, based out of Delhi for a long time. So they're probably one of the few universities that could have pulled it off. So they've done really really well. And, and again, congratulations to them. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Right, Dirk, should we bring in our guests? Absolutely, Rob. We should. Trevor Goddard, welcome to the Global Horizons Koala News News Podcast. Mate, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Rob, Dirk, thank you. Delighted to be here. Looking forward to having a chat. Absolutely. Mate, before we start, mate, you've had quite an illustrious career in international education. Can you just give us a bit of a background in terms of I guess how you started off in international education, how you got to kind of where you are today. Yeah, okay. Probably a a good starting point is to admit that I I didn't come through the traditional study abroad exchange, traditional education experience myself. My international experience came from some more sport-related things as I was pushing my way through uni. So I'll I'll speak to those just briefly. Um, Out of school, I got a cadetship for... Um, some work with what was then Ernst and Winnie, now Ernst and Young, as an auditor. So my life could have been completely different. The the beauty of that was that it allowed me to study for six months and then go and work for six months. And that meant that after two years, I sidled up to the partner and had a chat and say, look, you know, loving working for you, loving the place, but this is not where I see myself going. Shook hands, part of ways. He was probably one of my first mentors without me realizing what he was doing. And I'd always had a strong inkling for the health sciences and had spoken to friends about occupational therapy and made a very quick and easy jump the next year into occupational therapy. If I sort of push that forward, one of the opportunities I had through studying occupational therapy was to hang out with some groups and associations that supported people with disabilities and very quickly was able to combine my love of sport with this new career trajectory I was taking and found myself doing some guide running with a couple of local people, which was an interesting experience. So I had by that stage stopped running professionally, I'll say, in inverted commas myself, 
and found this other avenue to to keep running at a fairly fairly high level. Uh, a story that sits within that that I still am slightly embarrassed about, even until today, is that one of the guys that I ran with for a long time. You'll un- you'll appreciate this coming from Perth. The old um, logs in the park with the the two two verticals and the horizontal across. I, I ran a guy straight into one of those at six o'clock in the evening. I didn't see it. So he and I went over it and the shins were sore for a very, very long time. One of, one of the first lessons in, you know, having to take responsibility for someone else and with someone else and, you know, we went down in a screaming heap. But I, I got up literally and figuratively and, and went on from there and that was the start of something really big for me personally and that was that I, I got selected in the Australian team to go to the Barcelona and Atlanta Paralympic Games. So that was that was my international experience. I went from world championships in Holland in 1990, ran in Barcelona, ran in Atlanta in front of 90,000 people. And so, you know, with Paris coming up now, that's my that's my go show TV every four years watching the Paralympics with a great deal of pride looking back on how I was involved very early on in some of the development around the way that visually impaired athletes ran. So if anyone's watching Paris, the T11 category, for totally blind runners, um, that's where I was, and it's a it's a great thing to look at and support. And the the, the men and women that run those races are elite athletes and, and should be celebrated in that way. That was really aligned with occupational therapy, and that was where my career was going. And what what started to happen was that every time I was overseas, I saw other ways of learning and taking something from that experience myself. Even if I just if I just go back to, to Barcelona and the Paralympics, I remember sitting in the food hall, food hall, meal hall with, you know, six thousand athletes and I'm sitting at a table where there's someone using a knife and fork with their toes. There's someone who's there's someone who's being meal assisted with a care staff member. There's me sitting with my colleague who is visually impaired. There's people having a, a peg feed in a tube. And it was one of those moments that it sort of makes you realise that I, I was the other in that in that circumstance, for one of putting it a different way. And that really, to me, sparked my curiosity. And I, I think I'd always been a curious person. I get that from my mum, just always asking a question. And whether it's asking it verbally, it, it can be asking it visually as well. I just love looking at things and trying to understand how it works and why it's different. And that that's where my love of all things international came from, was realising that things weren't better or worse, things were just different. And so the more you tried to understand how they got to that point, the better off you then understood yourself as well. And that was a really important part of understanding my own learning style. As I said earlier, that was really my international experience through my university experience. That was the equivalent of a, of a study abroad or exchange experience. You know, along with that, having done occupational therapy and, and traveling overseas and then coming back, I ended up, ironically, coincidentally, back at the School of Occupational Therapy. During that process, I had the opportunity to put together with a colleague of mine, Nigel Gribble at Curtin, who is a fantastic therapist. We had the opportunity to, to co-design what was called Go Global at that point. And that stemmed stemmed out of an experience that I had working up in China. I was very fortunate to get a World Health Organization consultancy position working with an organization in Shanghai that was delivering therapy services to children with cerebral palsy. It was one of the first private organisations in Shanghai to do that. In working with the director over a period of time, we, we sort of, as we got to know each other, worked out that you know I, I was taking this wonderful body of knowledge away myself and learning a lot, and I, I wanted to find a way of bringing that back into French, one of the better experiences could. And the way to do that seemed to be to take those people away, to take the students up. So after, I guess, a year and a half of, of talking through what that might look like, what that might look like, and, and this is, you know, to put a timestamp on it, this is going back to 2001, 2002. So a lot of barriers at that point around curriculum, accreditation, students going overseas to China. I ended up taking a group of seven the first year. And by the time I finished up with that program, when I moved over to Melbourne in 2010, that program was taking about 130 or 140 each year and it had also spread into India, Ukraine and South Africa. And just a, a quick story because this is really important about where my switch over into international ed really came from. 
about four years into that program, we wanted to do something for the centre. At Curtin, as the university, wanted to do something to acknowledge all the time and energy that they'd given us. We spoke to the director about, you know, what, what would that look like? If, if we want to recognise you in some way, we, we want to do it in a way that's useful for you as well. Um, and, and she said, well, look, it's really difficult for us to get any airplay, press, media, coverage in Shanghai. And so many people don't know that we exist. They can't find us. And so what we ended up doing was making a presentation of a plaque that was signed by the Vice-Chancellor, Dean of Health Sciences. And we were very fortunate at the time, a fabulous Australian diplomat, Sam Jerovich at the time, who was the Consul General in Shanghai, came and presented it on behalf of the university. So part of my role was organising that. Consequently, Airplay, CCTV9 in China, which at, at that point, you know, main English language speaking channel, not suggesting we got this coverage, but you know that that has reached out to the you know 800, 900 million people in China, so it would have would have got a fair few people watching. That was the opening for her, and we, we still speak about that today as being a small yet significant part of launching what she was doing in China, and that came through us giving that publicity or enabling that publicity to happen through her connection with Curtin. And you know when I keep looking back on that, that opportunity for Sam to come and do that the willingness of our Vice-Chancellor to put his name on that, that was me sort of going, hey, I really like this idea of it not just being about the delivery of the service, but it's bringing in all these other representatives, both from industry and government, to actually stimulate the learning experience. And even for the students, the students that got to go on that trip where we made that presentation, that that became the talking point. And I think that really helped me realise that there was more to, more to the study abroad experience than just the initial reason or the classroom learning experience. It was what was happening outside where you could really add value to what you were doing. Well, one of the things that I always find uh, amazing is the backstory on how people get into international education. What I kind of find is that nobody really sets their career goals to say, I want to be a, a manager of learning abroad or I want to be a director international in a university. People just tend to end up there. So hearing these backstories, I think is just is fascinating. And Trevor, I mean, what an experience. I mean, the Paralympic Games into you know occupational therapy and then launching a program which is so successful and from memory i mean being working at curtain myself it's still going so you know kudos to you mate kudos to you thank you but also to the colleagues that remained and kept going and have built that i think the thing i'm most proud of that i don't take any credit for but i love watching is that and, and Rob, you'll you'll appreciate this. That program is now getting NCP mobility funding. You know, we'll come to NCP a bit later on, but you know, what a lovely full circle to be involved in generating and setting something up that's had so many iterations and so many wonderful people going through. And look, each of those countries that I spoke to, we had a fabulous coordinator into South Africa, Zona Rens, Kiralee Manning into Ukraine, Nigel Gribble into India. Those those staff members did an amazing job in setting up and mirroring those programs. And so the fact that they're now getting NCP funding all this 20 odd years later is testament to the work that they've done in perpetuating the learning experience. Absolutely. Wonderful acknowledgement. And Trevor, one of the things I've always enjoyed in, in our conversations is the fact you're such a great long-term thinker. I remember, and I'm going to segue us into some of the current news here, but I remember this story from when you were running the Go Global program and some students came to you and said, oh, you know, we'd like to raise some money to, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it might've been Vietnam, you know, raise some money to build a school or to build something or, you know, make some sort of contribution to the community. And you kind of said to them, yes, but what I want to see is your 10-year plan for continuing to fund this to make sure that it doesn't fall over. So, of course, I mean, you can build a school somewhere, but then the community has all of the running costs that come along with that. And I remember just being blown away. I think I must have been in my 20s at the time just being like, that is such a great way to look at something. It's like, you, know, you might want to do good, but in fact, in trying to do good, you can actually create a whole set of problems that come al along with that. And here comes a segue. <laughs> here comes a segue. Sorry, I just froze there for a second. Australian government, Dirk and I have just talked about this at length. Australian government has just more than doubled the visa fee for international students coming to Australia. As a very good long-term thinker, what's your perspective on what this does to international education for Australia. Yeah, thanks, Rob, and very, very clever segue. The, the notion of the longer-term thinking is so important for learning abroad. My gut says to me 
that this is a point in time where we need to recognise that international education is a suite of offerings that all sit together. They don't stand in isolation. So we can talk about the 10, 12,000 students that come in on non-award and talk about the direct financial cost. Incredibly important. I think where the longer term risk here is for, we go back to 2019 and the 58, 60,000 students that are going outbound into the countries where these students are coming from, the reputational risk cannot be measured. And that's where, that's where the problem is going to strike us. Now, if I, if I try and pull out two concrete examples, our two major source countries are also two of our countries for outbound or two of our largest countries for the outbound market as well. To me, it would not come as a surprise if there's a lessening of the collegiality that comes from some institutions, some people, some organisations because the way that they see Australia viewing their students and development of their higher education sector has been hit. And I think that's where we need to be incredibly careful that it's not just an upfront cost in the short term and a direct enrolment. It's also about how our partners perceive and view the way that we treat their national citizens as well. I love that take on things, Trevor. I really feel that the overlooked part of this, obviously there's the financial implications of it, but the impact in terms of our relationships, the perception of Australia as a warm, friendly, welcoming destination for people of all backgrounds is really under threat here. And that, that sort of stigma, stigmatised, what do you call it, perception that international students are only cash cows. I mean, what a fantastic way for the government just to like rubber stamp that and be like, yep, that's actually how we see it. Absolutely. The irony in this scenario is that the solution is actually present within the problem from from my perspective. At the risk of keeping on going back to the 2019 data set, which is the last big set pre-COVID, I'm just going to give you, if you give me a little bit of poetic license here, I'm going to give you some figures to show why I think it's such an important group of people. If you take Take 58,000 just across the universities alone. The average time spent overseas by each of those students is around five to six weeks coming out of the data set. This is where it gets mind-blowing. That's 5,700 years of time. That's the equivalent of 73 average lifespans. So if I said to you, you can take 73 people and take them away permanently and they become your representatives overseas. I'm just using that as an example to say, there's the small A ambassadors or the the power of the soft diplomacy and the relationships. And that happens year after year after year after year. So I think in, in managing the perception and changing the perception, there's just such a wonderful opportunity to reinvigorate this part of the sector and use these young people, use in a nice way, um, add Australian representatives overseas to influence and change that perception. I think it's a it's a missed opportunity and one that us as a sector need to step up and take take lead on. If you allow me just to to push that point one more, um, you know, data underpins that. You've got to have data to to consolidate your messaging, and I think historically, the learning abroad sector incredibly passionate and passionate about the individual. If I'm be honest, I think we've struggled to advocate from a sectoral point of view. If I go back to 2017, 2018, we would have had 34, 35 of the 39 universities all submitting their learning abroad data. That's now down to about 23 universities. So 58, 59% of universities submitting their data. It's tough. It's time consuming. It's hard to track. It's not the high profile part of the job, but without that data, the national picture doesn't get painted. And unless you paint that national picture, then you don't get a seat at the table, you don't support your messaging, you don't record your history, and you can't define your value. So I think as a group, the learning abroad sector needs to support each other in bringing that data set together to make sure that they give government something that they can hang their hat on as well. As you were talking, Trevor, what I was thinking about was just the recovery of learning abroad. And of course, for those who aren't really familiar with it, learning abroad is students from Australian institutions taking an experience and going somewhere else in the world. So it's the outbound side of of international education. 
And of course, having been in international ed for 20 years and, and spent a lot of time in learning abroad, to me, it seemed like every time institutions are really hit hard with their budgets, with crises and things like that, what ends up happening is learning abroad is one of those areas which gets deprioritized and it ends up taking a long time to recover. Firstly, I mean, do, do you share that view, Trevor? And if you do, what do you think these kind of current changes mean for the recovery of learning abroad post-pandemic? I do share the view, but I'll come at it through a different lens, Rob. I think the opportunity... Sorry, just, pause, just pause there. You need to, don't, I don't want to don't lose your thought, but I just want to point out to listeners what you just did there, because this is one of your superpowers. You and Kent Anderson, the two people that do it, and I absolutely love it, it's like you get asked a question and you pause and you reflect and you say, good question, but I think there's a better way to frame it. And then on you go, I'm just, letting, just pointing that out to listeners. That was a masterstroke, what you just did. We'll take compliment, but also the opportunity to explain. That comes from watching a number of colleagues and learning. And it's part of that reflective practice that I think sometimes I'm always conscious of what's the principle behind the question and what do you want to hear from that question? So I'll, I'll even stop sometimes and ask, you know, why why are you asking me that question? Is there some way where you want this to go? Where is this going to land? And that that's an important part of the dialogue. Not surprisingly, you know, my approach to learning abroad takes that into consideration. Um, I'm very keen to understand what the students want to learn and, and what their expectation is. But something, I'll just drop this in, Rob, and we might come back to it. Something I'm interested in at the moment is that I feel we may have gone, controversially, we may have gone a little bit too far towards the student experience dominating the conversation and forgetting that within the experience, there is an institutional experience and a national experience as well. And they're really, really important. And I think that comes back to your, your initial question around visa and costing. But back to your question around you know what this actually means in, in the recovery. I think the opportunity or, or where you might be going is that the opportunity is there for learning abroad to redefine the value that it brings to the sector. And that requires some uncovering of of a more data-led set of responses. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about learning abroad being a precursor to good career outcomes, good graduate outcomes. They're still very individually focused. and, And I think they're incredibly strong and powerful value propositions. What I'd like to see more is of how the institution links a learning abroad program up into a research partnership it has with that institution overseas or getting aligned with your industry collaborators and putting people through internships within the organisations that your institution already partners with. They seem to me to be commonsensical ways of actually leveraging the whole ecosystem because that's what universities are. My, My fear around this going too far down the student experience road is that students, of course, are front and centre of what universities do, but look at the other wealth of activity that goes on in and around and the way they make contribution to community and nation. Yeah, it's almost the sum of the parts, right? Rob and Dirk, so it's at the moment, some of the organisations I'm working with don't sit in the traditional learning abroad space, but it still has that notion of learning from the overseas experience. So I've moved a little horizontally as well and working with scholarship organisations, fellowships, foundations, as well as universities, schools, associations, and increasingly corporations that are putting their staff through or executive staff through PD programs overseas as well. And the similarities are there. The international experience, i.e. learning abroad, is only one element. What I'm really asking them to focus on, and this is a a growth spot for the universities, is the pre-departure phase and the post phase as well, which is incredibly important. How are you setting yourself up to learn? And then how are you applying that learning when you come back? And I think the analogy there in the university space would be how to increase that engagement with the academic programs as well. You know, we have wonderful one-off examples about students writing assignments on something that they saw. I guess I'm, I'm interested in a, in a deeper exploration of that as to how you allow a student to continue that learning abroad experience right through the rest of their degree. It's funny you say that, Trevor. When I was at um, Murdoch, we I worked with Jan Gothard, who, got it, who was part of an ALTC grant program that was bringing the learning home. And it was exactly based on what you're talking about. 
how do you continue? How do you embed? How do you ensure that students, when they return home, can reflect and actually understand conceptually the skills that they've learnt through their experience? How do they then apply them, as you say, into looking for a job? How do you explain your abroad experience to a potential employer? And, and how does that then go? And that then developed into a minor in global engagement, which we've run across the institution. So I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's more than just the experience. It's about being able to reflect on that experience, being able to see it multidimensionally, if I can put it that way, from a distance almost, and being able to say, well, that's how I learned, that's what I went through, and this is how it now pertains and the skills that I learned from that into the future, not just into potentially future study, but beyond that, into my life, into my career, into employment, into relationships, et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't agree with you more on that point. The difficult part of that, Dirk, is that there's a time element to that as well. And I think we've become a little bit too, um, dare I say, obsessed with the the immediacy of evaluation. I used to call it the chucking a microphone in the face as they hopped off the plane. And of course... They've all had a great time. They've all ate, eaten some awesome food, met some wonderful people, and they're on cloud nine, as as anyone would be. What what I think I'm more interested in and would like to help organisations track is what's the impact in five years' time, 10 years' time, and 20 years' time, and then to be able to retrofit that back into programs. Because all of a sudden, the value proposition for a vice chancellor, if you're if you're pitching for two million dollars in new scholarship money, the value proposition of students that are, can clearly articulate their career change, I'm an example of that, that have come back into postgrad study, that have gone out to work and bought their industry contacts back into the organisation, that have volunteered back as an alum into an internship program, there's value in that to the university. Now that's also far more measurable, long-term and embedded in the institution, and that has a much higher value proposition. So I think part of the difficulty is evaluating things, what I would call at the right time. Finding, finding the time to ask the right question is an important part of getting the information. And the, you know, coming back to that data set conversation, right question at the right time. Trying to convince a vice chancellor, but maybe also trying to convince a foreign Minister, maybe it's a good moment to take a left turn into the new Colombo plan, the NCP. And of course, Trevor, you and I were, were involved in the NCP from before, well before it was the NCP, before it had a name, before it had anything. You and I were involved in conversations with Julie Bishop and others, Don Markwell, to, to actually help design the program. It's, of course, celebrating its 10 years this year. What do you see as some of the the best achievements of the programs? And and maybe if I can ask you to be controversial, because I know you love a bit of controversy, what would you like to see the program doing over the next 10 years? So I've just committed the ultimate interviewing crime, which is asking the double barrel question. Let's start, let's, let's start, with, the, let's start with the first 10 years, some reflections on the first 10 years. I had locked both of them away, ready to come back to the second one. <laughs> in, in terms of the first 10 years, I'm going to answer the first question conservatively and the second question aggressively. And I'll, I'll explain how I think the two come together in a moment. The, the conservative one is I think it's done a very good job of betting itself down. You know, governments come and go, departments come and go, flavours come and go, names come and go. So... To essentially look the same as you did when you started, in some senses, while conservative, can have the effect of building and digging down, investing in longevity. And I think that could be a very useful thing. And so I'm going to back it in that's going to be around for a while in its current format. I called it the bells and whistles model, the, the DFAT overlay, a sense of what, what is what everyone in the nation would have known as learning abroad, continuing business as usual, but with this lovely DFAT um, connectivity, giving it a presence in the region and a champion in the region in Julie Bishop. And that to me was its strength. And I think it's held on to that. You know, we can all in the sector who have been around for 30 years name three, four, seven programs that have come and then gone as quickly as they arose. So I think to still be 
essentially in the same format after 10 years is, is something to be proud of. So there's the conservative part of the element because there's a, sometimes there's a lot of rowing behind the scenes to keep that going you know, as per normal. What would I like to see it do? I, I Aggressive, still, Trevor. Yeah, alumni, <laughs> alumni, alumni, alumni. What, what's happened to the, the global alumni strategy? What has happened to alumni beyond drinks and nibbles? What was the global alumni strategy? Because I guess it's kind of was something for a while and just seems to have disappeared. Yeah. So if it's if it's having another gestation, then I'd love for that to be a little more in the public domain. Because I think I think the NCP, as the largest of the outbound mechanics that fits into that, again has a very unique offering to make. Wonderful strategy around our international student population, our Australia awards recipients, etc. The NCP really help, holds itself front and centre as being the counterpoint or the balance to that. And the, the opportunity to have them as the outbound contributing is another place where the value of that program can land. So I'd, I'd love to see some more aggressive movement in that domain. Really interesting point. I'm, I was fortunate to be an assessor for the NCP last year. One of the key weighted areas was around how to bring that experience back. So I kind of feel like it's somewhat disappointing that that's not being taken advantage of. It's certainly in terms of the entry, it has a high prominence in terms of of the application process of having students who are going into the NCP program, being aware that there is an obligation at the end of it to, to bring that learning, to talk about it, to promote the program and to work with fellow alumni. So it, it's, I feel like, like I said, I feel like it's somewhat disappointing that that's not actually occurring. Really simple solution, Dirk, and very easy for me to say from the comfort of a podcast. And, and that is you have to teach people how to do that. I'll, I'll give two very quick, hopefully, anecdotes that, that demonstrate that point. Many moons ago, back in my curtain days, when I was a senior lecturer delivering community health and development courses, I went to a, a teaching and learning seminar around giving feedback. And my, my big takeaway, and I still I repeat this story ad nauseum, and many people listening now will have probably heard me spruik it at some point. The facilitator running the course said, the only way to give good feedback is to actually tell people that you're giving them the feedback. Otherwise, they don't realize it's feedback. The analogy being, the reason people don't know what to do when they come back is because we haven't taught them what they could do or how to do it. So it's very, very simple. Very, very simple. And I, my, the second part is a, a slightly tongue-in-cheek at our ex-Greens leader, Adam Bant, and his little press club, go, go, go Google it comment, that I was desperate to find a way of bringing this in because I, I think he stole that from me. Tongue, family planted in cheek. I think I was at a, a pre-departure session 10, 12 years ago, and there was a question from the audience around the weather related to the place that this person was going. And I stood at the lectern, and as Rob would say, did my inevitable five-second pause. And I did stop and looked him in the eye and just said, Google it, mate. Because I think what we've lost the we've lost the methodology in doing is that we're teaching people the actual fact rather than teaching them how to get to the fact. We shouldn't be teaching everyone about every law of the country that they're going to, but we should be helping facilitate where they look, how they look, the importance of understanding and how they use that information while they're away. So the world of TNL has changed dramatically and facilitating students to get that information and to be independent in the same way that they would be independent if they were traveling independently. That's what I think we've lost the will to live. That's the grab at the beginning of the program. We've lost the will to live. Just very conscious of the time, there was a couple of things I wanted to try and slip in, which was around, you know, the FTAs and ASEAN region, Southeast Asia economic strategy and how we don't, you know, learning abroad, we don't really sort of talk about that. It's just sort of there. I wanted to try and just make a comment about how we need to speak more into that space. Yeah. Obviously, by this point, Trevor, we're 10 years in. We've spent as a country probably close to half a billion dollars on the NCP program. And obviously, it's still funded into the forward estimate, so the government's committed to continuing to run the program. What other sorts of things do you think, you know, we as a nation should expect from from that investment, other than student experiences and soft diplomacy? Let, let me start with the student experience, 
because again, that's front and centre. And I, I certainly don't want to give the implication that I'm implying it's not important. It, it's a spectrum. It's not polarised. It's not that we talk about student experience and then stop and then we talk about industry and we stop and we talk about government. They, they all sit together. So where, where I think there's huge potential for uplift, upside, capability building is to make sure that whatever we design around the student experience that links into industry absolutely dovetails beautifully into government agenda as well. You know, we're, we're off the back of the 50th anniversary of the Australian partnership into the ASEAN dialogue and the conferences in Melbourne in March this year. We've just had in November last year, we've had the Southeast Asia Economic Strategy 2020, 2040. Preceding that, leading up to that, we had the Vietnam Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy. We've had the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Now, now these, sometimes they, they sound like documents that float above the surface somewhere. But I think learning abroad can engage themselves politically, small p politics, in those conversations. So tying programs into an agenda item, within each of those three documents I mentioned, they absolutely front and centre have people-to-people -people exchange sitting within them as an explicit agenda item. We should be dovetailing sweetly into that as many of the universities do within their industry engagement and partnerships. And a, a quick shout out, I just, well, when I say just, about a year ago finished up a block of work with AsiaLink. And I, I look at the work that Martine Letts, Lee Howard and Rob Law are doing out there. And that gave me a really interesting insight, again, through a different lens of how industry works within those documents. And there's a lot that the universities could learn and learning abroad in how to engage with those documents and those agendas to increase the level of activity they get in those countries. And the ASEAN region is ripe for that. So essentially to sum all that up, there's a wonderful opportunity to be more politically engaged as a learning abroad community. I'm getting absolutely devoured up here on the Sunshine Coast. What's going on the Sunshine Coast? That's my question to you. Be careful about Ross River. Hey, Rob and Dirk, just reflecting on other international-led experiences, obviously we all spend a lot of time on the road and travelling. And I just wanted to shout out to a, a really fine colleague and an excellent human that you've already interviewed, and that's Tracy Harris. And she made a comment on one of your earlier podcasts just around the very unglamorous. And, and I was reflecting on that for quite a while as to what my approach to travel had been. And I... I, th I thought it was worth just sharing that as well as the student experience, the other element that was always important to me was to try and travel like a student. Now, I, I know that sounds slightly corny, but just as an example, at the EAIEs and the NAFSAs of the world, I, I would always stay in a hotel that was 10, 15 kilometres away. I wouldn't stay in the major chains. And it just meant that you met different people, had different experiences had a slightly different experience of the city. Just one one very quick example of where that where that happened. In in Vancouver, I stayed at a, a very, very small B and B on the outskirts and so had a, about a forty five minute run into the city. But ended up meeting a guy at breakfast one morning who was there on a Churchill Fellowship looking at forestry management in British Columbia to come back and bring that knowledge back to New South Wales and Victoria. So it was just fascinating that there we were, international education Churchill Fellowship, both learning and, and looking at ways of sharing that knowledge. So it was just a shout out to Tracy for acknowledging that while it's unglamorous, often by putting yourself out into those positions, you get to meet some awesome people and have very different experiences that sit outside the conference circuit. As we like to say, it's all about the stories. Wasn't having you on the Global Horizons podcast, Trevor. Thanks heaps for joining us and uh, look forward to catching you a little bit later in the year, hopefully at one of the NCP 10-year anniversary events. And for everybody listening along, of course, all the news, the Koala News is your place to grab up-to-date information, what's going on in Australian international education. If you're not subscribed by now, you're absolutely missing out. So don't hesitate, thekoalanews.com. Dirk, always a pleasure to chat, mate. Thank you for keeping us up-to-date. Ditto, Rob. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time to talk. Thank you, Trevor. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. 
Sydney.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.